Hey everyone, welcome back to part two of opening a facility. Um, Cheryl is with us again. Hello. And it's Cheryl's fa favorite subject, um, numbers. Boring. <laughs> this is boring. It's important though, really important. It gives you a really good idea of um, what you have to look forward to and what you have to um, budget and, and you know some of the realities of this business. Well, I just wish that we had some of this before we open. Um, so I think it's extremely valuable. So, well, let's get started. Um, what I have here, I'm opening up, is a spreadsheet. And it's included as part of your show notes. So if you haven't opened it, go ahead back to the main screen and click on the Excel spreadsheet. And then download it and open it in Excel. If you don't have Excel, you can download a free program to open this type of um, file called Open Office. So you go to Open Office and you just go ahead and download so you should be able to open it. Okay, so this Express Excel spreadsheet um, is dynamic so when you make changes it, it updates the financials. I'm just going to go through the lines really quick and then we're going to go down in detail. The first line is uh, the number of residents. So if you see it starts with zero, it goes to one, it goes to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hopefully you can go to eight residents, but most people will end up at six or five. Okay, next is income. This is the amount of per resident that you collect. So resident number one pays this much, resident number two this much, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So as the residents move in, you can make changes or uh, you can play around with the numbers based on your market area. Administrative fees, gross income, a vacancy allowance. Okay, so that will give you... Oh, can't seem to move the screen. Hold on. Oh, that is the top. Okay, so the where it says the vacancy allowance, that's um, the total after the vacancy allowance, okay? And those numbers are all set down at the end of the screen down here, and I'll get into those um, a little bit in a little bit. But basically, when you first start out, as you can see, you're going to have no income, right? Zero residents, no income. And in order to determine what your going to be able to charge for your um, rooms. Cheryl, do you want to talk about market research? I think we touched on it in the previous section, but um, market research, right? Sure. I mean, um, I would definitely call around to all the facilities in my area and find out what they're charging and if they have additional fees for different services, because um, you definitely don't want to be the highest price assistant living in the area. You want to stay right in line with your competition or even a little bit lower. Um, so definitely calling around and trying to figure out prices is the yep. best. You also don't want to be the lowest, <laughs> right? Cheat no. yourself too much. Um, so, you know, some areas people charge more. Some areas they have to charge less. A lot of it depends on the supply and demand, um, how much competition you have, and the number of people in your area that need these services. So even though you open your facility and you think, hey, I'm going to charge 3500 or 4000 or 4500 or $4,800, whatever you think you're going to charge, um, that may change once people come through and look at your place and you're not filling because you're, char you're charging $4,500 for your, your private room or $3,800 for a shared room because the consumer is coming through your place and they're making comparisons based on you and everybody else. So even though you do your best market research, it doesn't mean that people are willing to pay that amount for your uh, for your services, right? Cheryl, just like a house, if you were trying to sell a house? Correct. Everybody thinks their house is the best. Right. But really, until you open up and you, you get to see what people, you know, you got to read them. And, um, you know, if people come through for a tour and they say all these nice things and you never hear from them again, it, it could be that your price is too high. Um, or what happens, Sherwin, 
when our prices are too low, what happens sometimes when people come through? What's the first reaction they say? Whoa, this is cheap. <laughs> That's right. Then we know we're in for it. And then you go, I hope these people don't take my room because as soon as they walk out it. the door, yeah, as soon as they walk out the door, you're going to raise your rate. Yeah. Um, but things change, you know, like sometimes, uh, I think we might have touched on it briefly, but um, when we opened, we could get a certain rate. Then a large 100-bed community opened up um, in the city, and they were supposed to be luxury, and they couldn't fill their room at their high rate of four or five thousand dollars and then we saw advertisements all of a sudden and do you recall that Cheryl what were they advertising they were their charging eighteen hundred eighteen hundred dollars yeah and then after a while I saw that it went up to about twenty one hundred I just stayed there for quite a while until they filled all their beds mm -hmm. um, and now they're they're higher tough. than us yeah now they're higher than us but, but during that time we went from being um, reasonable to being expensive, expensive. and it, yeah, we had a resident move out and, you know, well, they moved in and they said, hey, $4,200, that was reasonable. And then within six months, they came in and said, you guys are so expensive. And um, it, that's during that period. So you, you, everything, this is a moving target and, and it's also a moving target based on your availability. When you have more rooms to fill, you, you need to be a little bit more flexible because your costs stay the same pretty much when you have one resident or you have six. So um, just keep that in mind. Like when we have five vacancies, you know, or six, whatever it is, I'm, I'm wheeling and dealing. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing, I don't even talk to Cheryl about prices. Mm -mm. If I take somebody in, she says, I don't want to know. Um, but my main concern is making sure that the payroll is met, making sure the bills are paid. And, you know, you can always try to get more at certain times. But um, so basically, let's just show you an example. Let's say the first person moves in and they pay $3,500. Um, the $500 underneath that is the administrative fee. Okay, the administrative fee is something that you can charge for move-ins. It says $500 because that's an average right what what a lot of places charge and you're going to find this out from your market analysis what move-in fees are but let's just say the move-in fee is about fifteen hundred dollars so you put that number in here and what it's doing is it's calculating and it's saying it's saying on average um, you're going to have four move-ins or four um, I, I think I had it that you would collect eight of those move-in fees in a year, right? So eight administrative fees in a year. You divide that by 12 would give you $1,000, but you have to consider that some of that money is going to go to refunds. So I, I could add a refund uh, line in here, but instead I just deducted it right out of the admin fee. So anyway, I'm giving you a credit of $500 for every um, for the administrative fee. But that just to show you how it changes if I move it up to... Two thousand um, dollars, and then I move off of that. Whoop, it changes it to six hundred. I don't like that number, but let's just change it to uh, twenty-four hundred dollars, just to be divisible by four. Okay. See how that changes your your administrative fee, Cheryl? Are you seeing these changes in real time? I am. Yes. Okay. Okay, so it, it then it adjusts your gross income. Your gross income comes from the uh, first resident plus the administrative fees. And what we have here is a vacancy allowance. Um, vacancy allowance is something that's reality. You're never going to be full the whole year. Um, it's just, you know, when somebody moves or somebody passes, there's going to be a time period when uh, you're, you're finding the next resident. It's just a fact of life. So what you need to do is factor in a vacancy allowance. Um, you can play with this number depending on your market area. If people are always pretty full, then you can have a lower vacancy rate like this, 5%. But if you needed to do you know, 10%, then you tab off of it and it makes that adjustment to your, to your gross income, okay? So let's go back to 5%. So, 
All right, so now we have here, the next line item is rent expense. Um, if you have a mortgage, it'll be your mortgage payment, but the rent expense is constant, as you can see, with regardless of the number of employees, uh, number of residents. Taxes, um, property taxes, if you're renting, you won't have property taxes, but you may have higher rent, so it may be all wrapped into your rent expense. You can delete that if you want, if you need to, not if you want to. Uh, property insurance, uh, you're going to, if you're renting, again, it's going to be included in your rent, so you may be paying higher rent. You may have uh, personal property coverage. You can get a policy to cover the belongings in your property. Accounting and legal, this is if um, you have a big tax bill at the end of the year, your CPA charges you to do their taxes, you would just prorate that amount. So this would be 1600 times 12 would be about $1,800 or $1,900. So whatever your tax bill is, your your accountant tax bill, your accountant bill, you just divide it by 12 and enter that number. Advertising expense, I put $200 in here. You can definitely play around with that number, hopefully going up rather than going down. But if you're a rock star networker, then you may not need to spend $200 on advertising. Liability insurance. Liability insurance, when you get your license through the state, they're going to require that you uh, submit proof of liability insurance. And we talked about the liability insurance, how there's very few policy uh, p places that write policies for liability insurance. Uh, Ponce de Leon is one that's a risk retention group. So when, you, when you're applying for your license, you go to, you go to a broker, um, that sells Ponce de Leon insurance policies, you can contact Ponce de Leon directly. And I believe when we did it, when we were about six beds, it was about $1,000 or $1,200. So I put in $100 a month. You have to pay for it in advance at licensing, but I put this in here so that next year you're budgeted to be able to pay that $1,000 when the renewal hits. Licenses and fees, this will be, um, you know, fire alarm permits, um, building permits, this will be um, your renewal license. So in two years when you have to renew your license, you have to pay um, the renewal fees, which could be $1,000 or whatever it is. I think that's what I prorated here, that you pay about $1,000 in every two years. So this won't be a monthly expense, but you have to keep it in mind that these will come up. When you have nobody, no residents, you have no payroll. So payroll zero, 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 zero. You have no payroll taxes, no workers comp, health insurance, all the way down. So if you go all the way down, you see these numbers. Um, it brings it to a total operating expenses when you have no residents of $2,845. That is a net operating loss of $2,845. Okay, so let's go through these when you get one resident. Cheryl, anything on that? No. Okay, so your rent with one resident stays the same. Property tax, da, 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 all the same. Um, liability. Now here's your employee. Here's your your staffing. Okay, so l let's talk about staffing. You take in one resident. Now you have to meet staffing standards. Staffing standards here are. Um, Cheryl, do you recall what it is for zero to five? I think we. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I have it. 167? Yeah, I have it right in front. It's right in front of me. 168. 168. Yeah, 0 to 5, 168. And what is the, what that means is that's basically an employee around the clock. So 24 hours a day. So if you do 24 hour, if you do um, 24 hours times, I think, uh, the week, you're going to hit 168. So one person all the time. Now, if you see... Um, the next one up is zero to uh, six residents to fifteen. It goes to two twelve. So from one sixty eight to two twelve, I believe it's forty hours or so a week, right? Is that about? Yes. It's basically another full time person. But in that situation, you can use your administrator's hours. Cheryl, do you want, do you know about uh, who we can count and who we can't count as as uh, staffing hours? Right, anybody who has direct contact and is assisting your residents. Um, not the gardener, you know, not the maintenance guy. Um, you as the administrator, if you're um, managing meds, helping arrange doctor's appointments, doing resident care, you can count your hours, and your caregivers. Right, or a manager. 
And so a lot of people think they read this and they think, well, I need to have 212 hours. But if you're an active administrator, which I hope you're going to be, um, you're not you're going to be able to count your hours. So that's that. I, in 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 58A dash five. Um, 5.019 staffing standards. It's listed in the chart here that that you're seeing on the screen, and it it details all the um, what you need. And then down here, I think number seven, Cheryl mentioned it. Staff whose duties are exclusively building or grounds maintenance, clerical or food preparation do not count towards meeting the minimum staffing hours requirement. The administrator or manager's time may be counted for the purpose of meeting the required staffing hours provided the administrator or manager is actively involved. Okay, so I, I would recommend, you know, if you're going to count the administrator's hours, put, put the manager on the schedule, put your name on the schedule. So when the state's looking at it there. Anyway, so basically what we do at our facilities, we have three shifts. Cheryl, you want to talk about our shifts? Um, we do every eight hours, so we have a 7 to 3, uh, 3 to 11, and an overnight 11 to 7 a.m. Sometimes when we need extra staffing, the overnight's 11 p.m. to 9 a.m., and from that 7 to 9, they'll help with showers and breakfast and medication. You can also add in helper shifts. Um, we have sometimes 3 to 7, 4 to 8 o'clock in the evening when it's busy for dinner and meds and helping people get down. Um, we've had shifts in the morning from 7 to 11. Uh, there's all kinds of things you could do. Um, some people have 24-hour shifts or, you know, three days in a row. Um, some people have living caregivers. It all depends on, you know, how you staff your place. Kule? Yeah, sorry, I had there a mute on. <laughs> um, so, so we we listed the hours here on the on the spreadsheet. That's our scheduled hours. You can play around with them or change them as need be. Um, seven to three, three to eleven, eleven to seven, and then four to seven or four to eight, depending. We also did you mention the overlap that we have as well? Yep. yep. Sometimes, yes. Yeah, sometimes we do an overlap in the morning, which really works out. So the um, you only have to pay for two extra hours. If you have the 11 to 7, you have 11 to 9. But I, I have seen a lot of crazy things. I mean, but, you know, you, you need to do what you need to do. And when you're starting out, um, in order to reduce this heavy burden, as you can see, these three shifts, once you have one resident, um, it's seven, almost $7,000 in payroll when you factor in. It's over 7000 when you factor in the payroll taxes and workers comp. So you you've Cheryl, you've seen people do live ins, twenty four hour shifts, right? All right. kinds of Yeah, I already said all that. Oh, I'm so <laughs> I'm sorry. Um but I've also seen did you say the eight to eight shift? Sometimes they do a eight to eight shift. So they, they have uh normal shifts and then they have a person who works twelve hours overnight. They there's a lot of creative ways. Hundred twelve twenty five dollars for the twenty four hour shift. They work three on, four off, four on, three off. They rotate. But for us, you know, this this really works. We have staff that's been with us for years and years, and they don't quit. Uh, we don't have turnover. And I think with those other um, types of shifts, you're going to have turnover. You're going to have a lower quality of staff. So what you can do here is, as you can see in this um, sheet, it has on the right, it says uh, AM shift, and then it has the rate of pay, the hours, uh, the shifts hours, and the number of days. PM shift, the number of uh, you know pay. So you can play around with these numbers here. And as you change them, it'll change your, um, it'll change your, your payroll. See, so I change the PM shift from nine dollars to ten dollars, and it changes the changes the payroll. See, go to twenty four hundred. So definitely, when you have one resident, you got to be a little creative. Okay, and that may mean you working as many shifts as possible. So payroll taxes is it's something that um, 
you know, you're going to have to hire people W-2. I don't recommend doing 1099, which is what some people do. It, it can come back to bite you later on. It's not legal as far as our attorney told us or our, yeah, our, our um, employment attorney. So watch out for that. So if you, if, you pay, if you hire them as a W-2 employee, which means they work for you, a 1099 means they are subcontractors. Um, if they work for you, you have to pay payroll taxes. Pay, they actually pay 15% payroll. That's what payroll taxes are. Um, and you pay a portion of it and they pay a portion of it. So you're going you're gonna to get taxed and they're going to get taxed. And so that's what that is, 7.65%. Workers' comp is uh, something to protect in case somebody gets hurt. Technically speaking, you don't need workers' comp under a certain number of employees. I believe right now, currently in 2014, this may change. Definitely seek some uh, um, advice on this. It may be less than six employees. Should you go without workers' comp? I don't know. That's a judgment call on your end. Um, if somebody gets hurt and sues you, um, workers' comp can help you there. Would you say, Cheryl? Things do happen, right? Things happen. We fortunately haven't had too many incidents, but it's had about three or four over the last five years. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if, you know, if somebody hurts their back or something like that, it may be a minimal charge out of pocket, but it could lead to something much worse. So having that umbrella is, um, is helpful. So, so workers comp, Health insurance contribution. Cheryl, we looked into health insurance contribution, didn't we? Right. It's um, really expensive, and we didn't have enough participation from the employees, so we weren't able to offer it. Um, so hopefully there'll be some changes and things will get more affordable, but you know, that's something you'll have to decide and see what's best for you and your facility. Yeah, I think th with the recent changes in the health care law, a lot of companies are cutting back on health care. They're moving people to part-time shifts. They're shifting the cot they're shifting it to people have to do it on their own even with large corporations so you know again it goes to what does it take to retain good employees um you got to do what you can but it, it may be other type of insurance like we do um what what do we have cheryl vision and dental we do and that's extremely affordable right it is yes it's only like and then, 10 or 12 dollars a month or eight dollars even and we don't pay it the employees do. Yeah, we don't pay it. And it's, I mean, the, the employees like it. So that's one thing you can definitely do. What's the name of the company? The, we, we went through a broker, You just right? go through a broker because every area has different companies. Right, right. So our broker was able to line that up. But they're going to try to sell you on um, selling life insurance plans to your employees. They're going to try to sell you on health plans. They're going to try to sell you on everything. And they're going to want to, depending on the broker, um, some brokers like ours just he's fine with just the vision and dental but some brokers want to set up a, a a meeting where they get the employees and they can help them select the best plans and it in my opinion you're not doing your employees any benefit by letting them uh, um, sell these plans to your employees because they're anyway Repair expenses, that's my opinion. Repair expenses, you know, that's something you got to factor in. Marketing fees, I added this line here because some of you will use a marketing or placement service. Uh, we did, and, you know, you might have to do it in the beginning. They, some of them have a, uh, a lock hold on all the, the leads that are coming through a particular area. So that's something you need to factor in. And Cheryl, do you want to touch on that? Marketing fees, what they charge, and... Sure. Um, they charge up, some of them charge 100%, 75% of the first month's rent. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's valuable at times, and, and they do have leads and help you get your beds full, but, you know, it's nothing better than getting your own and uh, not having to spend that money because it does add up over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, just just take... 75% of that first resident that we're looking at there, I mean, you're looking at $2,600. That's a huge hit. And that resident, I mean, I'm not saying not to do it because we did, and you have to do what you have to do, but um, 
you know right now we don't take it we don't deal with them because we know that over the course of the year if I give somebody twenty six hundred dollars and I do it for ten placements that's twenty six thousand dollars over the year and I know for a fact that I could use that money better um, advertising my own company because these placement services will never ever market your particular company they'll go into places and they'll go around the community and they'll say I have all great homes and they will never mention your facility by name um, or promote your website or do any of those things so you're always going to be held captive and the more that you give them uh, the more you're stuck so if you're going to pay somebody $2,600 maybe you should consider investing in some newspaper ads and um, other things lawn care this is something I maybe you could take out your husband will cut the lawn you'll cut the lawn uh, something simple cable internet phone that's something that's a necessity it's a constant cost that goes across the board alarm monitoring you'll probably need an alarm monitoring service depending on your fire marshal um, and your fire alarm system we have to have fire alarm monitoring you'll need two phone lines depending on your fire marshal but most likely your fire alarm needs a secondary line to call out uh, to the monitoring center or calling out to the fire department when there's an emergency so expect to have two phone lines but it, it may you may be able to bundle it all together in your cable internet phone or maybe you can find a cheaper uh, option online uh, but the point the good thing is to show you all these potential expenses so that you can look and see where you can cut and where you can't cut janitorial expenses you know twenty five dollars to buy cleaning supplies and different things supplies expenses uh, this is just an allowance it increases as you're in residence uh, increase the same with um, office supplies and janitorial so supplies office and janitorial office supplies are like things like paper printer ink um, activities you'll have to pay you don't necessarily have to pay for activities you can run the activities yourself you can run them um, through your employees you can give volunteers so we hire people to come in our activity expense is higher than that for sure that's almost a weekly expense for us that's and worth I think it it's really worth it and it makes it it makes a big difference um makes a big difference helps but, your caregivers um, too yeah i think so and and the residents gives them something to look forward to and when people are coming to visit it it just brings life to your facility so do as much as you can we see it as a marketing expense more than it is um, but it's definitely you don't want your residents bored and and having an outside person coming in is 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 much better um Okay, utilities, that's going to increase as you have more people. Just by nature of having more people, you're going to have um, higher electricity costs, more water expense. That's just a fact of life. Then food expense, we budget about $250 per resident. It seems to work out to about that much. Uh, and we're pretty thrifty. We, you know, our, our, the guy who does the shopping goes to Walmart, goes to you know Aldi's. We do as much as we can. But it's it's definitely um, an expense, 250. So as you can see, the residents increase. So does your food budget. Now, I I personally, I mean, listen. I think food expense is an important thing. I think you need to buy good stuff, quality stuff. Don't buy the cheap, you know, one dollar TV dinners and because the times that families are visiting is the, is usually meal time. The time and besides the fact that it's the right thing to do right I mean you should be giving people quality food no canned food yeah we we use canned food because the residents like canned vegetables right but if they like quality fresh ingredients you should provide that that is something that you should be proud to offer your residents and um, you know nothing's worse than a family member coming to see their mom and they're getting something that they wouldn't eat something that's disgusting because Cheryl, will, will residents complain about food? Oh, yes, daily. But that's <laughs> what they look forward to. Right. And to me, it's a competitive advantage you have over other 
larger places that you can provide this home cook fresh meal experience and um, you know I I highly highly recommend it quality ingredients from scratch fresh food as much as possible medical supplies bandages um, wraps gauze uh, sterilizer these are things you just need to have and it's just an expense miscellaneous things pop up I can't tell you how many things pop up <laughs> you can only imagine Cheryl it's every month seems like something else right something's breaking or some insurance renewing some kind of bills coming on that's right so as you can see our miscellaneous expenses increase here as we get more residents because more residents more things break more things pop up it's just the way it is you know sometimes I have to run out and I have to buy insure for a resident because I can't get in touch with the family or there is no family or it's Medicaid people or whatever it is and I'm not gonna let this person who's not eating now not have insure uh, or I have to um, pay for something that got that got uh, that is missing we did have a resident who lost an iPhone didn't we we did yes so as much as possible you know those valuable items do not let them have it in there and um, you know you on move-in they may not have anything valuable valuable rings or cash um, but they end up having them we had a resident that had um, a huge amount of cash didn't she she did a couple thousand dollars stuffed in her mattress yeah and one of our one of our honest staff members found it and brought it to our attention but you know um, you're gonna have things missing I, I know we're a little off subject but I don't think we talked about it in the other parts but move-ins when people move in you want to keep their their um, valuables to a minimum because otherwise you're, you're gonna have to carry bonds and all these other things so just tell people don't carry anything valuable so as you can see I'm gonna go over the numbers here okay um, as you can see your first resident moves in you're taking a loss of twenty eight hundred dollars most of those things are constants the rent those things and I talk about that remember if you can have a relative move in there or you're living there or something to help offset some of those costs until you get your first resident first resident moves in okay you see your expenses go from twenty eight hundred dollars to eleven thousand five hundred twenty one dollars that's all staffing basically I mean you have other things that go up food and and activity and those things but that is all staffing so the, it is very important to get your first resident wouldn't you say Cheryl sure yes nobody likes to go into an empty house that has nothing going on yeah and and people when they come for a tour and you say oh we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that and we're gonna have this what are they looking for the, the, the people that are coming they're looking for who is my mom gonna live with like I don't see anybody here I don't see any acti I don't see them being able to interact with anybody and after my mom moves in what kind of people are gonna move in here that's very important to me because I was at another house down the street and they were all you know drooling in their wheelchairs or pushed in front of the TV and I don't want my mom or dad to be in that kind of environment so you need the first person but you know what that first person is extremely expensive so the first person is important but the second and the third person are the most important so you need to get from zero to three as fast as possible and you know how do we do that well look at what that large community did what, what did they do Cheryl the move-in specials right? move-in specials yes I mean they did what they had to do because if you think our our expense is big imagine a hundred and twenty bed facilities expense with the administrators the marketing directors the the, the food managers the the drivers the, you know they have ten residents they have to have full full pretty much full staffing the nursing so they don't mess around they get that place full they're out there busting their butt to get it full they're spending money on marketing because you want to get from zero to three they wanted to get from zero to fifty and um, you know and and it and it may be are you prepared to work shifts right Cheryl yes you've had to work, do that that's right we're you know be prepared 
but I want I know a lot of people make this mistake I've seen it I've seen it one of the people in our association who was wanting to join she was vacant for a year trying to get the first resident I sent her a lead and the person didn't have enough money or the person wasn't right or this or that and a lot of the other people in the group are saying well that's that's not how you do it um, there's a, a person who's in our group who took her first two people in for free they didn't have any money she just took them in and she didn't just take them in just to fill up she took them in because she wanted to help um, but really in the end it ended, it ended up helping her fill her place so you got to be prepared do what it takes to get it full um, so the second person moves in you can see your 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 expense um, your negative drops so you you know we show you this because this is reality I know it's scary but you can prevent it and you can prevent it by working shifts you can prevent it by having your cousin your brother your mother your husband you know you all chip in this is a family business you're gonna make it happen and then you get your third resident you're only losing a thousand dollars a month but still if you're working a shift you're not losing any money right or if you're creative you have a live-in uh, for the beginning part you can do things then you get to the fourth resident and now you're starting to make some money and that's that's with you not working any shifts right and so two thousand dollars with your fourth resident um, fifth resident you're at 44 28 now all of these things change depending on your income that you take in so if you if your fifth person is paying thirty eight hundred dollars then your income at the bottom changes okay but what we want to do is when we're making money when we're when we're at these stages Cheryl <laughs> what would be your advice when you're making money save it don't spend it <laughs> That's right. Don't go get a new Mercedes or. Well, I mean, you can get it, but just budget because you may have three people pass away in another month. That's right. This is That's the reality. time that you maximize your earnings and you put it away. You save up for those times when you have shortfalls, when you have three vacancies or whatever it is, and you have the money, the flexibility to continue your advertising, continue paying your staff, continue to do the things that you need to do because it's that consistency in service, consistency in marketing, consistency in everything else um, that, will, that will make this a better experience for you and it'll help you stay full, keep your employees, project to the families that are involved, the families that are coming, the, serve, the vendors that are visiting your facility, they, they always see the same staff. They, they begin to understand that this is a professional operation. And see, when you get to six residents, I mean, it's it's much prettier, right? So hopefully you can go to eight, uh, seven or eight. You may not be able to, um, but something to keep in mind is that you may not be able to do this on your first one, but if, if you haven't bought a property yet or you haven't rented your property yet, or if it's, it's something you're thinking about doing, I want you to look at the difference between six and eight residents. It's a huge difference. And, um, you know, beyond that, even better. But you can still provide a quality of service with eight. In fact, I think you can provide a better quality of service. So even if you're at six now and you're going to get started and, and six residents look good, maybe your second facility is going to be that one. I mean, we met a lady that actually started with uh, six and went to 20 or 30, I think 30. What did she have? Uh, ECC place, right? Cheryl? Yeah, I'm trying to, I, I can't remember. The remember numbers. the lady in Orlando and then she opened the 100 bed facility after that? Yeah, she, I think she went to 25 beds. So 25 long. and then she went to 100. And um, it took her years, but she was, you know, disciplined and she was good at what she did. She provided quality service throughout. She had a good reputation and um, that was a big jump. But she said that her favorite facility was her 25 bed facility right it was yeah, easy. much easier than the 100 bed facility um so you know play around with this this spreadsheet um and you know see if see if the numbers work for you i'm trying to go over my notes here um oh oh, oh quickly cheryl if you are taking in somebody 
or if you're doing a tour and you're and some people always say well if I have a high price I can always come down in price right I'm doing a tour and I say my room rate is forty eight hundred dollars for that private room and my shared room rate is thirty eight hundred dollars do you think that peop you can always have that opportunity to come down later on yeah of course no I mean huh? <laughs> what I mean is some people will not even give you an indication that it's too high. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Like, it, they'll leave and not call you back. That's what you're saying. That's right. Uh, some people I mean, think, you can always come down in price, but you're going to miss people in the in the process. That's right. And you need to be really aware of it. And maybe you need to be a little bit grayer in, in, in how you say your price prices because you cannot always read people. And so you'll tell people price and then you'll think it's all great, and you'll think, well, I'll always come down if they think it's too high. I'll just tell them tomorrow or the next day that I'll work with them. But you'll never hear from them again, and, and then they walk out the door, and they'll go find another facility. And by then, it's too late. So especially in the beginning, when you have zero to three residents, you need to be really quick on your feet and a good judge of people's situations. And a lot of that, it starts out in your when they first call you or they first come to your facility, the first contact to understand their situation. So before I even tell them a price, what it, do you do the same things too, Cheryl? You start to ask questions? Ask and... questions, try to, you know, get some background to see, you know. Sometimes it's the people with money that try to negotiate the hardest. Right. The people with money, you can do that with, right? But the people without money... They won't say it. They'll just, you know, my mom only has $2,800 or $3,200 and I, I can't afford your facility. Um, so you you need to, to so what I always ask them, I do give them a range. I have a low end range um, and then I have a high end range. And I say, but it depends primarily based on the room size and, and the services needed. So it does give you some leeway. So, um, Right, I we we started that range, right? Right, and that seems to work pretty good. But don't just assume that you can just come down. Um, they'll walk out the door. So, I think that's it, guys. Uh, I hope you liked the spreadsheet. It was not um, easy. We didn't have this when we started, and um, I know it would have helped us, and it would have made us, um, you know, avoid some growing pains. Would you say, Cheryl? Well, absolutely. So. But don't don't minimize these numbers too much. I mean, in this reality, it's what you pay your employees is gonna be a be a big. De, um, uh, it's gonna determine the quality of service you provide. You're gonna have turnover in staff. We pay eleven dollars an hour, so that's not even really factored in there. But we don't have turnover. But you you have to look at your market. Like, what does it cost to retain an employee? Call around. Uh, look on Craigslist. You, is that what you would look on to to look at uh, market? Um, sure Craigslist calling around yeah Cra Craigslist and you know there's and if not Craigslist there's a million other places to search where people are posting jobs uh, a lot of times you'll see larger companies job postings but to get a real clue of what other people in your market are doing um, I'd look to the smaller homes That that's it well thanks guys okay bye Cheryl alright bye